everyone coming and attending, and we're so grateful to have you here. Um, I'm Cami Cannon, and today we're going to hear from Claudia Nischwitz. She's going to be talking about common vegetable diseases. And she's been at USU since July 2010. Uh, she's the extension plant pathologist for Utah. And she does research on vegetable and tree fruit diseases. She also does diagnostics for samples that are submitted to the Utah Plant Pest Diagnostics Lab. She does detection and management options for plant diseases that are submitted. And she got her master's at University of Arizona studying charcoal rot of melons. And then she got her PhD at the University of Idaho on forest diseases. And she did postdoc work in Georgia and Arizona on virus diseases of peanuts, onions, and tobacco, and labyrinthula of turf grass. And um, just a little story about Claudia. Um, when I very first started working here, I had a a garden that I went to and the grower was concerned that they might have curly top virus but it didn't look like curly top to me so I didn't know what it was and I took it to Claudia and she found some tomato russet mites on on the stem which are really really small they're microscopic and hard to detect so she detected those and then showed me them under the microscope so she's she's very thorough with her work and does a great job of of assessing plant diseases or finding out if they even have a disease. So here she is. Thank you, Cami. So Cami asked me to talk about the most common vegetable diseases that occur in Utah. There are actually quite a few. I picked the most important ones and she wanted to focus on plant disease identification, mostly for all of you who are out there. So I added a little bit of information on plant diseases management, but I might just gloss over it very briefly. And then when you have the presentation, you can take a more detailed look at it or send me an email if you have more detailed questions about it. And now it's not moving. Let's see, you're, I guess you're using your arrow keys on the keyboard? Yeah, do I just use the mouse? Because I used the arrow click. keys before. Yeah, you may want to click inside the window to make sure it's highlighted and then try and use your arrow keys. Oh, yeah. There we go. Okay. Sorry, that's the first webinar I do. <laughs> so the symptoms of many plant diseases can be very distinct, but in some cases, several different pathogens can cause the same symptoms on a plant. And in some cases, environmental or abiotic factor factors like nutrient deficiencies and things like that can cause very similar symptoms. So in the case where the symptoms are very distinct, you can make the diagnosis most of the time yourself. In other cases, you get the confirmation from a diagnostic lab or your extension agent or a crop consultant just so you're having the correct diagnosis and you do the um, manage it correctly. So we'll start out with some bacterial diseases and after each group of pathogens, I'll stop and we'll ask um, if there's any questions. So we'll start out with Liberibacter. This is a pathogen that has shown up or was detected for the first time in Utah in 2013. It occurs in all the surrounding states. It is a, a non-culturable bacterium, so you can't, we can't isolate it on an artificial medium to make the determination. It has to be done through molecular testing. It causes diseases on potatoes, tomatoes, and peppers. We do see it on all three in Utah. In general, it's most important on potatoes. It causes zebra chip disease. It is transmitted by potato psyllids, and here on the bottom of the screen, you can see an adult psyllid here. If you see them on the plant, they look like a, a small aphid, black aphid with wings. And if you can catch one and you have a hand lens and you look on the back of the psyllid, it has this very distinct white stripe. If you have a very strong hand lens, you can also see the, the nymphs and the larvae that are here in the middle picture. The eggs are so small that you actually need a microscope to see them on their little 
um, stems at the edge of the leaf. So zebra chip disease, above ground symptoms on the potato plant look very similar to nutrient deficiencies. And to some extent, that's actually what it is because the, the bacteria will block the vascular tissue inside the plant. And so the plant can't take up water and enough nutrients. Some of the red discoloration of the leaves is actually a result of the feeding by the psyllids. They cause, uh, they inject the, a toxin that causes the leaves to turn red. But to determine if you have a nutrient deficiency or if there's actually the, the Liberia bacteria inside the plant, you would have to submit the sample to a diagnostic lab and get it tested. If you look at the potato tubers that come off these plants, you see those brown striations on a fresh sliced potato tuber. And then where the name comes from is if you fry these slices, you see those brown, dark brown discolorations. And obviously, if you're growing potatoes for a potato chip industry, they would not take those. On peppers, the peppers usually have like a, a yellow green color to the, the newer leaves. The plants are often stunted. So up here this, in the upper left corner, this bell pepper, it has normal looking bell peppers, except that they are only about an inch and a half in size. And the plant was very stunted. Sometimes this can also be caused by curly top, which is a viral disease I'll talk a little bit later about. So again, you would have to get a identification done through a diagnostic lab. On tomatoes, it again looks very similar to a nutrient deficiency. You get these yellow um, leaves that have just green veins. I've not seen any symptoms on tomato fruit. And so I can't, I can't tell you if you will see any or not. To manage Liberia bacter, it's not very easy. You have to scout for the potato psyllids, manage the potato psyllids with insecticide sprays. Good weed management can help to control um, the psyllid populations as well as remove overwintering hosts for the bacteria. And once a plant is infected, there is no cure for it. You might as well remove it. And talk about bacterial spot. That's another disease that showed up in Utah about three years ago on peppers and tomatoes. It's caused by several species of a bacterium called Xanthomonas. The bacteria can be seed borne and they can also survive in, in plant debris for about three years. So if you have infected plant material that has been left behind in the field and you would put potatoes in there the next, uh, peppers or tomatoes in there the next year, you could get um, infections just from the plant debris that's left in the field. It's spread from plant to plant by splashing water, by wind, or by humans that are walking through the fields and then dispersing the, the bacteria. Usually this disease is not a problem if it stays dry, but if you have a, a thunderstorm or rain event come through, you will usually see the inf um, symptoms about two days later. The symptoms on infected seedlings, if you grow your own transplants, they may not show symptoms. But sometimes the leaves can turn yellow and they may fall off. It might just look like somebody didn't irrigate your seedlings well enough, but it could also be that you had contaminated seed and that was the first symptom that you saw. On older plants, they usually develop brown necrotic spots on the leaves as well as on the fruit. And on tomatoes, they the um, brown spots are surrounded by a yellow halo. Eventually, the leaves will die. And on tomatoes, the dead leaves usually remain on the plant and on peppers, they will fall off. So we have some pictures here. So you see these small brown necrotic spots here on these leaves. That's the foliar symptoms. Similar foliar symptoms can be caused by other pathogens as well as from spray damage. So it would be good to get a, um, an official diagnosis. The symptoms on the fruit are fairly distinct. Here you have the 
the black brown spot in the middle surrounded by that yellow halo. And here you have it on a green fruit with brown spots. Oftentimes these spots are just confined to the, the skin of the fruit. So I, I've not tried eating one of those. I have no idea if the bacterial infections will change the flavor or not. On bacteria, you again see these brown spots on the leaves. Here you see some a little bit more distant. And then eventually the leaf here turns yellow and it will, it will fall off on peppers. The fruit, it looks almost like you, um, it got hit by hail. It has all these brown, small brown spots and then eventually they can get bigger uh, as they merge together and you can get these large necrotic dry areas on the fruit. Very important to control bacterial spot on peppers and tomatoes is to buy certified disease-free seed. A lot of the seed companies will test their seed for bacterial spot presence or, and then uh, give you a certification of their seed that it is disease-free. If you have tomato or pepper plant debris from previous years and you might have seen some of the bacterial spot, it would be good to remove it from the field or plow it under if you can. Rotate to other crops that are not susceptible. Anything that's not in a solanaceous or the same family as tomatoes and peppers for one to two years would, would be beneficial. You can apply copper products when you see the first um, leaf spots show up. Uh, several states bacteria have already been, become resistant to copper. So depending where your strain comes from, you may or may not have success using pop, uh, copper products. There are resistant pepper varieties, but it depends on which of the races of the bacteria you have. Some of these races have been able to overcome resistant varieties. So again, it would be something that you would have to, to try and see which varieties work best for you. There is no resistant tomato varieties for bacterial spot. I'll talk briefly about bacterial canker. We see that occasionally in Utah. It does occur on both tomatoes and pepper, but economically important, it's only on tomatoes. Primary infections, which I have not seen in Utah confirmed for um, bacterial canker, is that the plants start to wilt. Leaves infected are infected through the bacteria invading the openings of the leaf like hydatodes or, or stomates and they might develop yellow margins which is known as firing. Usually in Utah I see the secondary infections which are the spots on, on leaves or fruit. And on the fruits the spots are very distinct. They're white with a dark center. And fruit infections occur either through initial flower infections or through the invasion of um, trichomes which are hairs on the young tomato fruit. So here on the right you can see um, the symptoms in the tomato um, plant. You see that brown discoloration of the vascular tissue and I've not seen that in Utah so far. What we usually see are the, the symptoms on the tomato. You have these white spots with the dark center and that's, that's very characteristic for bacterial canker. Bacterial canker is also seed-borne, or it can be transmitted through contaminated pruning tools after handling infected plants or, or by splashing water. These bacteria can also survive for up to two years in plant debris, so some of the infections may occur if rotten fruit was left in the field that had the bacteria before, and so you plant more tomatoes in that same field this year, and then you could get infections from the the bacteria that survived in that plant debris. To manage bacterial canker, again, you know, disease-free seed is, is key. Disinfecting trays and pots and benches for your transplants. You want to clean your pruning tools with a 70% ethanol solution or disinfecting wipes. Avoid overwintering, irrigate in the morning so the leaves and the fruit dries off fairly quickly so you don't have any sitting water there. Crop rotation, uh, remove solanaceous weeds like nightshades, 
deep plow plant debris. And copper-based products have been effective in a greenhouse transplant production setting, but they are ineffective after you transplant the plants to the field. So are there any questions about uh, bacterial diseases? Uh, there was one question, is Liberibacter seedborne? No. It's the only way of transmission that is known is by um, by the potato solids. They have tried growing infected potato tubers, and either these tubers don't produce any sprouts, or if they do, they are, um, they're so small and stunted that you'll never get any potatoes off of those, and they've not been shown seed born in tomatoes or peppers either. Okay, and then there is a question about Please explain why irrigating in the morning is important. If you irrigate in the morning, there's it warms up, so your leaves and, and fruit, if you have overhead sprinkler irrigation, will dry up faster, you reduce the humidity, and then the bacteria cannot use the film of water on your leaves to enter the, the leaves or the fruit. Okay, and then one more was, are there beneficial beneficials that prey on psyllids? That's a question for you, Cami. I don't know. I'm not sure either. Um, I'll send you my email and you can email me that question and I'll, I'll look it up and find out. All right, let's move on to the viruses, which many of the diseases we see in Utah are viruses since our climate in the summer is usually dry. So tomato spotted world virus has become more important in the last probably three, four years. It is an important pathogen of tomatoes and peppers. It's transmitted by thrips, especially western flower thrips, and up here you can see a thrips uh, strongly magnified. Usually if you're not familiar, if you have a seen a thrips, if you see an orange speck of dust on leaves that starts running, that's usually a thrips. So they're, they're very, very small, but they can cause, with the transmission of viruses, a lot of damage. The thrips have to acquire the virus or pick up the virus as larvae on an infected plant in order to be able to transmit it once they become adults. And once that larvae is infected, the thrips will carry and transmit that virus for his entire life. Tomato spotted world virus is not seed borne, but plants can get infected early in the season, basically as soon as thrips start moving around. The symptoms on tomatoes and peppers is uh, initially on the leaves, you see small brown spots. You get stunted plants, especially if they're infected very early. On immature fruit, you might see uh, brown rings. And on the mature fruit, you can see yellow ring spots, or sometimes a calico pattern of different colors. So here on the bottom right, we have some leaf infections. You see those brown spots. And if you remember the bacterial spot leaves that I showed you, these symptoms look very similar. And unless you do a specialized test, you can't really distinguish those. Easier to distinguish is when you have young green fruit, sometimes you get these brown necrotic spots on the immature fruit. And then also if you have mature fruit, these symptoms are very characteristic for tomato spotty wilt virus. You get these red, yellow, blotchy tomato fruit. On peppers, you also get these brown rings on the leaves. And here, you cannot necessarily say it's caused by tomato spotted world virus, but the symptoms of these ring spots are usually indicative that you have a viral infection. These are little jalapeno peppers that are infected with uh, tomato spotted world virus. You get some rings, and you can also get a, that calico pattern of green and red, orange on the, the fruit. To manage tomato spotted world virus, you can 
use insecticides, but since these thrips are very small, they can hide in every nook and cranny of your plant and might escape the insecticides. Resistant tomato varieties do occur. They were bred more for the southeastern United States where the virus was initially a larger problem. We have tried some here in Utah and to see if they could handle the Utah climate, and they did all grow. Uh, some of them may have had some trouble uh, actually producing or finish producing fruit before it got cold, but most of these actually work pretty well. There are no resistant pepper varieties, and in and some uh, scientists have tried using reflective mulch and had uh, some success with it using like a silver mulch over the beds instead of a, a black mulch. Tobacco mosaic virus are in a very closely related tomato mosaic virus. Tomato and tobacco mosaic virus can both be seed borne as in tomato as well as in other plants. They can also be transmitted by handling infected plants or by handling tobacco products, including tobacco for smoking as well as chewing tobacco. It survives for about 50 years in plant debris, in contaminated pots and, and other equipment that comes in contact with the sap of a plant. And it does survive curing of tobacco. It was the first virus that was ever identified. That's when they realized that something smaller than a bacterium actually existed. And it is fairly difficult to control. You can try disinfecting pots and tools with bleach, or um, some places they tried using a 20% a powdered milk solution. Change gloves frequently when you uh, handle plants that might have been infected with tobacco mosaic virus so you're not spreading the virus to um, other plants. The symptoms on the foliage are very difficult to see. It's like a mosaic pattern of dark green, light green areas. And you can see it best if you take a leaf and you hold it against the light because then the lighter green areas here, you will well, the light will shine through. Usually you see the foliar symptoms on heirloom tomatoes, and you will not see fruit symptoms on heirloom tomatoes. On hybrids, it's usually the opposite way. You don't see symptoms, at least in my experience, on the leaves, but you will see symptoms like these yellow spots with brown rings or just brown spots on the fruit. And when you slice through one of these spots, it will go deep into the flesh of the tomato. On peppers, you usually don't see symptoms on the fruit, but you get this um, oak leaf pattern on the leaves. Uh, it can cause yield loss, even if you don't see symptoms on the fruit. You may notice that you have 20, 30 percent less yield on some of these plants. Again, to manage tobacco mosaic or tomato mosaic virus, you want to have use certified disease-free seed if you um, plant your own transplants. There are resistant varieties, tomato varieties out there. All of them are hybrids. There's no resistant heirloom varieties. Disinfecting pots and tools. Replace the plant substrate in your greenhouse beds or wherever you grow your transplants or your tomatoes because all the roots that are left in the ground from the previous crop will carry that virus. And as they decompose, the virus will get into the soil and then it can infect the new roots that come in when you plant your next tomato or pepper crop. And again, change gloves frequently. Potato virus Y, it's not something we see very often in Utah, but if we do see it, it can actually be fairly devastating. There are three strains. There's PBYO, PBYN, and PBYNTN. And the difference in these three strains is that the PBYO, or zero, causes only uh, mosaic symptoms on the leaf. So you see a kind of a red, 
uh, light green, dark green modeling on the leaves, but you don't see any symptoms on your tubers. They look perfectly fine. Potato virus YN causes necrotic or brown spots on the leaves, and again, it does not cause any symptoms on the tubers. So these two are not quite as bad as NTN, which causes necrotic lesions on the leaves, but it also causes ring spots on the tubers that extend into the, the flesh. And Yukon Gold is one of the varieties that's very susceptible to that tuber necrosis. And if you were growing tomatoes, uh, potatoes for commercial use, now if you see this ring in there, you see it up here on the outside of the tuber, and then when we sliced into it, it was inside as well. You could not sell those potatoes. And here you see the necrotic lesions on the actual potato plant. Potato virus Y is transmitted by aphids. It can also be transmitted by equipment if you go through with a cultivator and you have sap of infected plants on your equipment and then you um, continue going on. You cause small wounds on the healthy plants. You could transmit it. Aphid transmission is more secondary in the field. So if you have an initially infected plant that came from an infected seed piece, the aphids could move it from that plant throughout your field. Usually the main spread and introduction into fields is by the use of infected seed pieces. So if you can get certified uh, disease-free seed pieces, it's your best option, but there's no guarantee because sometimes they will miss a potato that might be infected. And then if you have infected plants in the field, remove them so the virus cannot be spread by the aphids throughout your field. Alfalfa mosaic virus is a very common virus in alfalfa here in Utah. It does not cause many problems in alfalfa besides a you know, light green, dark green mosaic pattern on the leaves. It's transmitted by aphids, but if it gets to tomatoes and peppers, it can cause more severe symptoms. You get a calico pattern on leaves, and you get a yellow mosaic on potatoes, and some strains of alfalfa mosaic virus can cause stunted plants as well as tuber necrosis. For management, you want to avoid planting potatoes, peppers, and tomatoes right next to an alfalfa field, because the aphids will move it quite readily. So here you can see a calico pattern. It's not that easy to see, but this is a dark green part of the leaf, and then in the back there's that light green part. Here's a tomato plant that is infected with uh, alfalfa mosaic virus, and down here we have a, a potato plant that has a yellow and green mosaic pattern on its leaves. Watermelon mosaic virus has become been very important in the last probably four years in Utah. It affects summer squash, winter squash, pumpkins, and zucchinis. It causes color breaking and warts on the fruit. And it causes a mosaic and distortion of the leaves. And in some cases, that distortion can be so severe that it almost looks like herbicide damage. It's also transmitted by aphids. Management is you, you can use resistant summer squash varieties, but most of them are GMO. You can, need good weed control. Uh, clover and some of the other weeds that often grow around the fields can be a overwintering host for watermelon mosaic virus. Alfalfa is also a host for the virus, and so you want to avoid planting close to alfalfa if you can. So the symptoms on the leaves here, you get this mosaic pattern, dark green, light green pattern, and that can vary in intensity. This leaf doesn't look too bad, but then if you look at this leaf here, it's very distorted and, and misshapen. This looks almost like herbicide damage. And then with fruit, you can get ring spots. There's a lot of var variety in the symptoms by watermelon mosaic virus, depending on the variety of the the squash, the type of squash, etc. This is a summer squash that shows some color breaking so it doesn't turn completely yellow as it should. 
uh, the, the the fruit of these of the summer squash is perfectly fine to eat with the with the symptoms. It just doesn't look right. Irish yellow spot virus is the most important onion disease in Utah. It affects onions. It can occasionally go to garlic. I've not seen it on garlic in Utah yet. You get a yield loss when the plants are infected early in the season. Because what happens is that you see brown spots that develop on the, the leaves. They're lens-shaped lesions. And then when these lesions merge, the entire leaf turns brown and dies. If that happens early in the season, this leaf will not get any nutrients down into the bulb. It cannot no longer photosynthesize, take sun up, and, and produce all the nutrients and sugars that the bulb needs. And so you get very small bulbs. If you're a commercial grower, you get less money for very small bulbs. That's why this disease is, is so important. It's transmitted by onion thrips. They're, they look very similar to the Western flower thrips that I showed you for um, tomato spotted wilt virus. Management of iris yellow spot virus is good thrips control with insecticides and good weed control. There's a lot of um, weeds that can be a host to both the virus as well as the uh, um, thrips. So the symptoms you see on these on the leaves initially are these lens-shaped lesions. Here is uh, multiple lesions on the leaf and eventually these leaves mer these lesions merge and then the leaf will die. These are iris yellow spot virus lesions on the seedscapes. And on onions a lot of the symptoms of different diseases initially look the same. So you get these lens-shaped lesions for downy mildew, you get these lens-shaped lesions for purple blotch, you get them for iris yellow spot virus, you can get them for tomato spotty wilt virus. So if you want to make sure you know what disease you're dealing with so you can, um, identify, can manage them properly, you might want to get a sample identified, diagnosed. So this is what it, a field looks like when you have Iris yellow spot virus come in very early. It, it almost looks like the, the onions are mature, but they are just infected with the virus and the leaves have died and just fallen over. Any questions on virus diseases? Yes, there were some questions. Okay. So someone asked, we use compost. Does this spread disease? The tobacco mosaic virus, yes. Um, some of the other viruses, like iris yellow virus, no. But compost can spread also a lot of other diseases, like some of the bacterial diseases we talked about earlier. If the compost does not get hot enough, these, vir these um, bacteria could survive. Also, some fungal pathogens can survive, and you could spread them with your compost. In some cases, if you, you put... Um, weeds on your compost pile that have been killed by herbicide. Some of the herbicides will not break down fast enough before you disperse your compost and you could see herbicide damage in all your plants. Okay, um, the next, in listening to the spread of the, these diseases, it seems like we need to really keep our tools clean, which I'm glad to know. Would you recommend not tilling in any plant debris to help with not spreading these diseases? Yes, if the plants already show symptoms, I would, would just throw them in the trash. Okay. And then someone set, made the comment, regular alcohol works for reinfecting tools, but I, I think they might have meant disinfecting tools. Um, it has to be about 70%. That has been shown to be the best if you have 100% alcohol, for some reason it does not work as well as a 70% alcohol solution, but nobody really knows why. But if you use something like Clorox or Lysol wipes or other disinfecting wipes and you clean it really well, that does help for many of the diseases too. I don't know if it would help for tobacco mosaic virus since that one is a tough one to kill. But for many of the other bacterial diseases, it would, would work. Or disinfecting your um, 
pots and, and trays with 10% bleach solution. That helps as well. And you can use that for some of your tools as well. You just have to make sure you clean, you rinse them off really well so the bleach does not cause corrosion. Okay. Thanks. On the tomato spotted wilt virus, if you eat the fruit, is it harmful? Often we have not realizing that it was a disease. No, tomato spotted wilt virus will not cause any harm to you. I don't know how the fruit tastes because some of the viruses cause fruit to taste bitter. And then another similar question was, can these unattractive fruits still be eaten? I'm not sure which disease, though. Um, again, that depends. I'm not sure some of these pathogens will change the flavor. And with the bacterial spot we had, some people I think have tried just peeling them and, and using the tomatoes for canning, but again, I have no idea how it tastes. Okay. It may not taste good. And then what distance from alfalfa field is recommended for tomato, pepper, potato growing? Well, that's a good question. Um, I would probably say at least like if you can a quarter mile away. Most of the time when we see it, the, the alfalfa fields are either bordering right up to the vegetable fields or they're maybe a uh, hundred feet or so away. Which I know in Utah with a lot of alfalfa that we grow, it might not be that easy. But you could use something like sticky cards and at least monitor if there's aphids moving into your um, potato fields. And maybe you could you know, manage them. Spray a border with, with an insecticide to catch the aphids before um, they, they move into the plants. Or you could plant a border crop with a non-susceptible plant variety. So the aphids would feed on that plant first, leave the virus behind before they move into your vegetables. That would apply to watermelon mosaic virus too. Okay. And then there was a couple other questions. If I plant alfalfa as a green crop and till it under before planting the main garden, is that a problem? No, not unless you have shoots come up that are infected with various viruses. If you just plow it under and it'll be, and you, you don't have any shoots coming up, you'll be fine. Okay. And how do we best control thrips on onions? Uh, most of the time they use insecticides to, to control them. There's a variety of insecticides that can be applied. But uh, I think Diane Alston would be the best person to contact for that. And we, we were talking yesterday at the onion grower meeting about how um, higher nitrogen levels, it seems like that attracts um, thrips. So using an adequate amount of nitrogen. Yeah, but you will not eliminate the thrips. So all, okay. you, all you need is one thrips that's infected. Mm -hmm. And I know in Georgia they, they looked at what percentage of thrips was infected with tomato spotted wilt virus and they found that 5% of the thrips was infected. Oh, wow. <laughs> and they caused a lot of damage. So, mm -hmm. you know, you, you might, you reduce your number, you reduce your chances of getting infection a little bit, but you're not completely eliminating the thrips. So I think a combination of nitrogen, lower nitrogen levels and uh, insecticide sprays might be a, a better option. Okay. And someone said, why is it called iris yellow spot? Do iris transmit this disease? I, it's, it has the name because that was the, f irises were the first plant this virus was identified on and it caused yellow spots on iris leaves. And interestingly, even though it has that name, I've not seen another report since that initial one in the late 90s out of the Netherlands that this virus has been sh seen on, on uh, Viruses. What they do with the virus nomenclature is they name the virus after the first plant and the symptoms it causes on these plants where they first found it. So like tobacco mosaic virus, they found that virus causing the yellow light, yellow, no, dark green, light green pattern on tobacco leaves and that's why they call it tobacco mosaic virus and it has that name for all the other 
plants it infects because it is the same virus. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, oh, sorry, were you done? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Brenda says the taste isn't altered. I think that was referring to tomatoes. Uh, tomatoes by world virus. Okay. And then yeah. uh, if you cut, Paul says, if you cut off the, those leaves infected by a virus, et cetera, will the plant regrow? It will, but it will still be infected with the virus. Usually the plants are systemically infected, so that means even if you only see it on a few leaves, the entire plant is infected, and there's, there's usually no cure for them. So you might as well remove it before the insects move the viruses to all your other plants. Someone said, uh, so is it okay to have iris beds nearby? Yeah, I don't see any reason not to. Okay. Oh, and then Brenda was clarifying. She said, sorry, it's when using the tomatoes for canning, it doesn't affect the taste. So oh, okay. Thanks, <laughs> and let's see, I think that's all for questions. Okay, so we'll move on to the fungal pathogens. The most common one we see in Utah is powdery mildew. Uh, powdery mildew occurs in Utah mostly on cucurbits, peppers, and tomatoes. It damage in vegetables is caused by the reduced ability of the plant to photosynthesize, which means it can't take up enough sunlight to produce sugars and other nutrients that it needs for the, the fruits to develop and the plant to grow because the leaves are covered by the fungal mycelium, the, the fruiting body of the, the fungus, which reduces the fruit quality and the yield. Usually those plants, uh, those fruit have lower concentrations and sugars and you get less yield. And in some cases when the leaves get really heavily infected, they might turn brown, dry up and fall off. And then the fruit that's below that, um, those leaves could get sunburned. So here you see powdery mildew. This is on a cucumber leaf. You see that powdery layer on the leaf surface. It, it looks like you took some flour and you kind of dusted the leaf with it. And then there's, that's what you see on most plants. There's one exception where the powdery mildew does not grow on the leaf surface. It actually grows inside the plant and that's the powder, one of the powdery mildews you see on tomato and pepper. And when you turn those leaves around, you see little white spots on the underside. And if you have a very strong hand lens, you might see what almost looks like little trees coming out of the underside of the leaf. And that's the powdery mildew. On the upper leaves, all you see are these um, yellow spots on the, the leaves. So powdery mildew is one of the few fungi that do not like uh, water. It like, all it needs to grow on the leaf is a little bit of dew for a, a few hours in the morning or some high humidity. So if you have a very rainy year, you will see usually very little powdery mildew. There's several cultural methods you can use. You can plant resistant varieties depending on the crop. You know, they, are, they are available. Remove infected plant material at the end of the growing season to prevent overwintering. So all the dead infected plants you want to take out and fungus does produce overwintering fruiting structures that could then hang out on those dead leaves until you plant your new crop in the next uh, spring. And plant spacing can help if you plant your plants further apart. You have more air movement going through and a, there's less dew on the leaves for a much shorter time and you also reduce the humidity and you have a lower risk of the spores on the, the leaves to germinate and, and colonize the plant tissue. Chemical control, usually sulfur products work very well for, for many powdery mildews. You want to make sure that you read the label for the product that you want to use to see if it's actually registered for the crop you do want to use it on. Do not apply sulfur above 90 degrees Fahrenheit. You will fry your plants. So either apply it very early in the morning so there's still maybe three, four hours of time that the spray can dry up or spray it late at night or in the evening 
when after it cooled down below 90 degrees Fahrenheit because otherwise oops, I didn't have the picture yeah you will fry the, the plants and then there's also other products something that cont uh, contains the active ingredient chlorothalonil there's quite a few products out there too that you could use Uh, verticillium will. Verticillium is a soil-borne pathogen. It produces a fruiting structure called a microsclerotium. Microsclerotia are very small, round, hard balls of fungal tissue. They're usually black. They're, they contain melanin, which um, deters a lot of other microorganisms from feeding on it. And so they can stay viable in the soil for up to 10 years. Just even without a host plant, they're just waiting for you to plant something that they like. It infects many vegetables, including tomatoes and peppers, also potatoes. Uh, eggplants can be a host as well. Conditions for infections, you need moist soil temperatures between 70 and 81 degrees Fahrenheit. It usually stops growing once the, the soil temperatures get to 90 degrees Fahrenheit. The transmission, if you plant infected transplants or seed potatoes that would be one way to introduce it into your field soil cultivation you can move it from field field to field on equipment that has soil attached to it it does also produce some spores that are growing on the plant up up ground buff ground plant tissue and those spores could be moved by wind and, and water but most of the infections are through um, soil. The symptoms you see, you will see a vascular discoloration when the stems are cut. And I'll show you a picture of that in a minute. You see plants that are wilting because they can't take up enough water as their, their vascular tissue is dying. The symptoms may only appear on one side of the plant, so it could be that half of your roots are healthy and not infected, and the fungus has infected the other half of the root and moved up into the vascular tissue on that side, and then you only see one half of the plant wilting. You see yellowing of leaves, the leaves turn brown and then dry up. And on tomatoes, sometimes you see a yellowing of the lower leaves in a V-shape. So here you can see that, that V-shape on tomatoes. And here it's not that easy to see, but you can see some discoloration of the, the vascular tissue when you cut the, the plant. Here you can see infected potato plant, leaves drying up, and here you can see the um, vascular disc discoloration. This is what the healthy leaf should look like site looks like and this is what the diseased site looks like and then in potato tubers if they're infected you can see a brown ring very similar to what you might see for for zebra chip disease there's another pathogen called fusarium it also causes a wilt and it's also soil borne it has very similar symptoms so you would um, need to get somebody to uh, the diagnostic lab to grow it out for you and tell you exactly if you have verticillium or fusarium. It will help you with your management for the disease. Because there are resistant varieties available for both verticillium and for fusarium. So when you buy or look up varieties that you would like to buy for tomatoes or peppers, resistant varieties will have a V in the disease resistance category. If it's resistant to fusarium, they usually have like FUS or something like that um, written on it that will tell you if it's resistant to verticillium or fusarium. Plant disease-free transplants, if you buy transplants and they're already completely yellow, they might just need some nitrogen, but there might be something going on with their roots, so you might want to avoid those plants. Remove and destroy infected plant material. Like I said, verticillium can survive for 10 years in the soil without a host, and it can just live off that plant material. You can use pre-plant fumigants, but usually they're only an option if you're a larger operation. 
damping off is a, is a seedling disease we frequently see in the early spring. It, the causal agent is a fungus called Pythium. It's also soil-borne. The seedlings turn brown or black at the base and they literally just fall over. And you can see a tray here it has some healthy seedlings. And then it has some infected seedlings that died and they just fell over. Sanitation is very important for damping off. Um, Pythium produces spores that can swim in a film of water. And so if you have newer disinfected seedling trays, you want to use those rather than the old ones that have soil in them or you might have just planted a, uh, a tray and you planted those out and you're going to reuse them now for another crop. If they had Pythium in that soil and you plant your next set of seeds, you could get more infections. Use sterile or heat-treated soil. Since this is a soil-borne pathogen, if you use compost, you could potentially introduce it. Do not overwater. Seedlings sitting in water are more susceptible, as this pathogen can move very well in water. Do not plant the seed too deep. It causes more stress on the the seedling to get through the soil to the surface, and is also exposed longer to the pathogen. And if you can get seed that's treated with a fungicide, that would be very useful because it would prevent the damping off. We have Botrytis necrot, that's another onion disease. You will never see symptoms of Botrytis necrot in the field, but once you put your potatoes in uh, tomato onions in storage, excuse me. The top of the onion gets soft after a few weeks and then when you slice it open there's a brown discoloration inside the bulb that goes from the top down. So here you can see the top of the bulb. It's kind of a flattened area now. Fungal, fungus is producing spores here on the surface and then if you slice them open you see that discoloration starting from the top down and it can go all the way through the bulb. And you can lose a lot of onions in storage to that pathogen. The management for that pathogen is very easy. Just wait until your onions are completely mature, the leaves have dried up, and the tops are down. So if the, the top part of the leaf here is still, you have green leaves, this is still juicy, green tissue, you do not want to cut the leaf stem because that will allow the fungus to enter through that neck and move down into the pathogen, uh, into the bulb. But if you wait until that top part is completely dried up before you cut off the leaves, you will not see an infection with Botrytis necrot. Then we have uh, Embolesia skin plot, which we sometimes see on garlic. The fungus survives in the soil, plant, debris, or infected bulbs. The symptoms you see are, is a dark gray, black spots on the outer skin layer of the garlic bulb. And most of the time, these symptoms are only superficial. It does not affect the market value of the, the bulbs, but somebody might ask you what, what causes that disease or that problem. So here you can see the garlic bulbs with the, the brown spots, but if you peel that off, it's usually all you see. There's a picture here of the spores of that fungus. Embolesia prefers temperatures that are between 78 and 84 degrees, moist soils. With manure applications can actually increase disease development. Red garlic cultivars are less susceptible than white ones. You can just remove the outer skin of the bulb. And if you do store the garlic, you want to keep it uh, in dry in the storage facility. And that's all I have for that webinar today. Awesome. Any Thank questions you, on fungi? Uh, there were some more questions. Mm -hmm. Priscilla asks, I know you noted one resistant disease plant that is GMO. Are most of the resistant disease plants also GMO? If not, how can we tell if they are or are not? They usually say if they are. And I know most of the um, um, summer squash will say if they are, or you would have to contact the person that's selling the seed and ask them if they are GMO, if it's not. 
uh, listed. Sometimes just a simple Google search for the variety will tell you if they are GMO or not. I think most of like the tomato varieties for tomato spotty wild virus, none of them are GMO as far as I know. The only ones I, I know for sure are, as, are some of the summer squash varieties and they do say it. Okay. And then uh, Spencer asks, how to disinfect trays? What solution? A 10 to 15% bleach solution. If you have like a big bucket, just put the bleach in the, the, with the water in there, um, let them soak for an hour, and then rinse them really well with water because you want to make sure that all the chlorine is gone so you're not getting damage to your seedlings from the chlorine. And you can use a 10 or 15% bleach solution also to clean off you know, greenhouse tables or areas where you had your trays sitting. Okay, and someone asks, what does GMO mean? Genetically modified organism. So usually they inserted a gene. Most of the time for viruses, it's part of the, the virus genome that they insert, which prevents the, the plant from becoming infected and showing the symptoms. And someone says, to clarify on the Botrytis necra, I can pull the onions from the field while the leaves are green but let the tops dry fully before cutting, or do I need to leave them in the field till the tops are fully dry? No, you can take them out and just let them sit somewhere until the leaves are completely dry. Okay. It's the, it's the moisture on the neck if you cut the green leaves off that allows the fungus to grow and get inside the bulb. Okay. Uh, how do onions get Botrytis necra? Is it just from the environment in an open yes. wound? Yes, it's a, it's a fungus that's around in the, in the fields and it just needs a wound, which is when you cut the tops off to enter the onion bulb. But if that area up there is very dry and there's no moisture for the spores of that fungus to germinate and colonize the top, then it, it cannot infect it. But if you cut it off, when their leaves are green, and you've probably all cut off a, a bulb with green leaves, that there's a lot of juice coming out of that area, and that would allow the spores to germinate and then grow down into the bulb and colonize it in storage. Okay, then someone asked, how long does a compost pile need to cook before the diseases are killed off? Can manure compost safely be used on berries? That's a good question. I don't know what the actual length is that you would have to grow, uh, keep a compost pile. I usually prefer not to compost anything that does have a disease because if you do not get the temperature high enough in all parts of your compost, you could still spread the disease even if your compost is two or three years old. And then do you know if manure composts can safely be used on berries? I don't know. Okay. For residential gardening, are there preferred organic pesticides? For powdery mildew, sulfur would be one that could be used. Um, some of the bacterial, like the copper products, I think are used for, uh, can be registered for organic. Um, Powdery mildew, Kali green is another option. That's potassium bicarbonate for powdery mildew. Okay. That's about all the ones that I know of. Okay. And someone said, in Arizona, we get invasions of spider mites. I spray my plants with water and soap solution. Then I, oh, and then he's asking, can you just spray your plants with soap and water to kill a fungus? No. That that works on, on insects, but it doesn't work on fungi, unfortunately. Okay. All right. And someone said, thank you so much, Claudia. Very helpful information. You're welcome. <laughs> Thanks for joining the seminar. And then there's a couple more questions. Would vermicomposting be a better way to manage pathogens? Um, I don't I don't think it would make a difference. Because some of these pathogens, like verticillium, you can 
have it go through the stomach of a cow and it will still be viable. Mm. So I don't think of using worms for the composting would make a big difference. Okay. Then 10 to 15% dilution of bleach, such as Clorox, which is typically 5 to 6%, correct? Yes. Not, not to find a bleach solution that is 10 to 15%. No, no. Okay. take the regular Clorox household bleach and make a 10 to 15% solution of that one. Thank okay. You. Okay, and then Priscilla says, thank you for the information. And Lisa asks, sulfur products seem difficult to find. Can you give any brand names or for home gardeners? It's usually just a, a wettable sulfur is what they call it. And most of the times here in Utah, I can find it at like home gardening stores, Lowe's, Walmart, Home Depot, garden centers. If not, you can probably find it on the internet for purchase depending where you live. Someone said IFA. Yeah, they might have that too. Okay. These were just a few examples of stores that I mentioned. Okay. I think that's all the questions I see. Okay, just uh, for folks reference, um, you probably you may or may not have found this by the learn link, but I'm going to put that in uh, chat and video will be available there. And I guess as well as on, well, there'll be a link to the video there, which is on, uh, I guess, uh, Utah State's YouTube channel. So that, that'll be available uh, within a couple of days. Um, any future webinars you guys are planning, Cammie? Yes, the next one is in March. Okay. Let me just pull up my schedule. It's March 14th at 10 a.m. And that one's on biological pest control on vegetable crops. So that would be the natural enemies and biological control. So. Great. Yeah. Okay, so if there's no other questions, thanks, Cami. Thanks, Claudia. And we will yeah. see, we'll see everybody in a few, few, few weeks. Awesome. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.